In the next 60 minutes here on Newsnight, President Akufuado appoints COP Christian Tetayonu as Deputy IGP in charge of operations. We have details and reactions. Also tonight, Auditor General indicts scores of school feeding caterers for feeding thousands of people in basic schools with unwholesome meals, including seven of them with food containing pebbles, worms, and weevils. At the time they were paying 97 pesos, rice was selling 140 Ghana cities, 180 Ghana cities. But now, rice is 700 cities. So we were trying our best. Is that the reason why the quality of Absolutely. food is not the it's best not, in some schools? The quality. We manage it a small way of quality. We have details for you. Also tonight, the anti-LGBTQ bill will remain in Parliament a bit longer as the Supreme Court defers its ruling on an interlocutory application aimed at preventing Parliament from transmitting the bill to the President. The decision of this court on this, on this application for an interlocutory injunction is hereby deferred to abide the outcome of the determination of the substantive suit. We have details as the Attorney General says the court has been fair in arriving at his decision to defer the ruling. Also tonight, latest Afrobarometer report, a significant decline in Ghana's democracy um, as it attributes it to economic crisis, mismanagement and corruption, sparking outrage among citizens. Some of the countries like Ghana, we've seen a huge drop in satisfaction with democracy. The economic situation in Ghana in recent years has not been particularly great. You know, the youth, have, as I've already said, like their colleagues elsewhere, are not happy with the amount of jobs that are being created. We'll get to hear from the former chairman of Malawi's Electoral Commission advising Ghana's Electoral Commission to heed the findings and maintain its credibility to prevent chaos in the lead up to the 2024 elections. As election management body, it's always important to remember that uh, credibility, 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 credibility is very important. In business, pickup in VAC collections contributed significantly in Ghana Avenue Authority, hitting half year target of almost 68 billion cities. And in sports, Ghana's members of parliament cut former professional Black Stars players to size with three goals to one in the Curtain Razor match for the maiden edition of the Democracy Cup, with MPs showing they are not just lawmakers. We have details of that in tonight's edition of Newsnight. You want to join us with your thoughts, your comment is via WhatsApp 55 We are live on X Spaces. You can leave a comment there with the hashtag Newsnight. I am MFA Apau. Hey, my name is Evans Benson. We start tonight with our breaking news from the uh, presidency with a statement that has just been issued appointing a deputy IGP. MFA, what are the details? So the statement is signed by the Director of Communications, Office of the President, Eugene Ahin, and it's captioned President Akufado appoints. IGP, uh, COP, I beg your pardon, Christian Tete Yohono as Deputy IGP in charge of operations. It goes on to say, I'll read verbatim what the statement says, Evans. He says, the President of the Republic, Nana Adodankwa Kufuado, has appointed Commissioner of Police, COP, Mr. Christian Tete Yohono, as the new Deputy Inspector General of Police in charge of operations. This appointment is pursuant to the advice of the Police Council at its meeting held today, Wednesday, 17 july 2024 during which cop yohunu's exceptional credentials and dedication to duty were acknowledged cop christian tete Yunu is a distinguished law enforcement officer with a career spanning over three decades and has held various key positions within the ghana police service president akufado extends his heartfelt congratulations to COP Christian Tete Yohono on his well-deserved appointment and wishes him the very best in the discipline of or discharge of his duties. Uh, so if you're just joining us, a statement from uh, the presidency there appointing a deputy IGP in charge of operations. I want to bring in right now a former uh, deputy interior minister. He's also right now the ranking member on the Defense and Interior Committee. James Agaga joins us on the line. Also joining me is security analyst and chief executive officer of the Security Warehouse Limited, Adam Bonner, also joins us right now. I'll put it in context. This is coming mm -hmm. uh, some four months to a major election. And I want to get your thoughts on these uh, the, the change that has just happened there with the addition of uh, Mr. Yohono, who have been there already mm -hmm. and has been doing some work now as a deputy. IGP. Uh, Mr. Gaga, first to you, you were a deputy interior minister. You're ranking now. Uh, good move? Well, um, ever the police service has always had um, the position of deputy inspector general of police as one of the 
topmost positions uh, that any government would want to uh, feel. Fortunately, for uh, some time now, that position has been left vacant. And so if the president has decided that he's filling that vacancy, uh, in principle, I don't think there is anything wrong with that. In any case, who is COP Yohunu? COP Yohunu, for a very long time, was the second in command after the Inspector General of Police. So any time you saw GP2, GP2 was synonymous to a Christian Tete Yohunu because he was second in command. And therefore, nothing has changed dramatically. The only um, suspicion I have is that um, listening to what you read out, the wording of Tete Yohunu's appointment suggests that he's going to be Deputy Inspector General of Police in charge of operations. Is that to say that we're going to have yet another appointment, uh, you know, in charge of administration or what? What I do know and what the position has always been is that we've had one slot reserved for a deputy inspector general of police. And so I thought the wording of that letter would have been that, okay, he's deputy inspector general of police, simple and straightforward. But to say his deputy inspector general of police in charge of operations could mean that we may have a second appointment. If, 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 if a second appointment is made, you know, to uh, occupy the position of Inspe deputy inspector general of police, in addition to uh, Christian Yohunu's appointment, that would be problematic for me, Evan. So when it says in charge of operations, does that tie the hands of the current IGP to have supervisory jurisdiction over operations, for example? Not necessarily, except that if you say his deputy in charge of operations, I mean, he would work up to the IGP. But the, the fundamental question is, uh, are we going to see yet another appointment uh, of a deputy IGP responsible for administration, or what? If not, it was unnecessary to say his deputy inspector general of police in charge of operations. That is my, my worry, because what I do know is that the position of deputy IGP is one, one slot. In the past, we've had some people occupy that position before. I think Mills Robinson was deputy inspector general of police, uh, the former Inspector General of Police, IGP Alassan, was once upon a time a Deputy Inspector General of Police. But on, on, on occasion, I can remember Dr. Marfo, he was also Deputy Inspector General of Police. They did not share the position with others. That is why I am a bit curious as to whether the President, by uh, the letter issued in his name, intends to appoint yet another commissioner to serve as uh, another deputy inspector general of police in, in, in addition to Christian Yohunu. That said, I should congratulate Christian Tete Yohunu. I mean, he's a seasoned police officer. He's acquitted himself very well. I think at some point he was even given the order of the uh, uh, star of Volta or so. I don't quite remember the... Uh, appropriate uh, uh, title of that award. It was a national award. I mean, in recognition of the sacrifices and, and, and hard work uh, uh, he had uh, actually put up. Stay with me. I want to bring in uh, Adam Bonai into the conversation. Adam Bonai, you've watched the police service very closely. I remember having a conversation with you years back when we were uh, thinking about who becomes the next IGP. And you had the list of individuals, and Mr. Yonu was, was one of them. Uh, what's your comment on the change that has happened tonight in terms of his moving up to become a deputy IGP? Well, just like my brother, Honorable Agaga, said, the, usually you have deputy IGP, simpliciter. You don't have deputy IGP uh, in charge of operations because then uh, you have director general uh, operations within the Ghana Police Service. And remember, 
uh, COP, uh, let me congratulate him, just like uh, my brother Agaga did. He's a fine police officer. We, he was one of the people who uh, we did our survey some time ago, uh, you know, when the position of IGP was vacant. And so, uh, I mean, we can't take that away from him. He's a very disciplined police officer, and we expect that uh, he would do us uh, he's been doing. He's already the GP2. If you look at the, the uh, hierarchy, he drives, the, he's a GP2 and he performs deputy IGP uh, you know, functions, even though uh, maybe within the political sphere or the executive, it is not official. But within the police ranks, he's a deputy IGP, if you ask me. But like uh, my uh, Honorable Agaga said, if you say in charge of operations, What's the meaning of in charge of operations? It's something that they should have explained to us because then uh, the most recent deputy IGP was uh, Opon Buenu. Opon Buenu was deputy IGP to uh, Asantia Pietu. And uh, he was, uh, you can go back to his appointment letter, he was deputy IGP simpliciter. And so are we now going to have maybe not one, but several deputy IGPs? Deputy IGP may be in charge of finance, deputy IGP in charge of uh, admin, in charge of services. Is that what we are going to see? And so mine is that uh, already, Yohonu, the good thing is I was performing that function, that function or the functions as uh, the function of a deputy IGP. But uh, call it four months into an election for every democracy like ours, usually. The, the, the top hierarchy of the security architecture is usually not tempered with. It's something that we should know. It's a convention. It's not usually because once you begin to temper with it, it brings about a lot of suspicion. It brings about, you know, people beginning to read meanings into it and asking questions. And so... Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and tonight, is considering the to do that. yes, it is, and considering what has happened recently, and you know, the police itself was forced to issue a statement to deny exactly. reports that the IGP had been removed. Uh, the timing of this has come up uh, and raised a few eyebrows. Are saying, well, you have a deputy IGP, yes, qualified, but with a specific responsibility of being in charge of operations, and the questions are being raised about the disappointment at this time on the back of the police itself dealing with rumors of the IGP being undermined. Does this play into that? Well, it does. I mean, you, you, I'm on several platforms, and already people are saying, ah, is this, uh, you know, a way to ask the I to, to uh, you know, out the IGP? I mean, and what I say is that I doubt this is going because then uh, no... No president will do that, or no leader will do that four months into an election, because that would be catastrophic. If any president attempted to do that, that would still, there would be a lot of, uh, I mean, definitely, I, and I said, well, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, your COP, your Honu, we can't take that away from him. He's a fine uh, police officer, COP, very disciplined. Those I know him. Uh, I've worked closely with him in the past. And so I can say he's a very fine police officer. But like I'm saying, the timing is the thing. Uh, is it, what is it? But like I said, the convention all over the world, you don't temper with the, any security architecture uh, during, you know, as usually six months into election. Uh, and Trump on, wanted point... to do that before he lost the election. And his, his advisors asked him not to do it. And, and, and on that point, let me bring in uh, Mr. Gaga on that. Mr. Gaga, what's your comment on the timing? Well, um, I have stated the uh, uh, fact that, look, all along we've always had the GP2, and the GP2 is the second in command after the IGP. And, and so if the idea is to um, make the position official by feeling the vacuum that has been left for quite some time, there is nothing wrong with that. But I, I, I am curious that the designation of COP Yohunu as Deputy Inspector General of Police in charge of operations. What makes you curious? And like my brother Adam Bona has stated, are we going to see yet another appointment of a Deputy IGP responsible for finance, 
administration, HR, or what? If that were the case, we would have distorted the uh, uh, hierarchical organization but, but, but of also, the service. But also, Mr. All, Gaga. Along, all along, we've had the IGP as number one, deputy IGP number two, and the commissioner. But, but also, Mr. Gaga, you've been the deputy uh, interior minister before. Don't we already have a director general uh, responsible for operations in the police service currently? Yes, we do have a director general who is a commissioner uh, and is responsible for operations. And in that sense, then, what now happens when you have a DG, that have you have a deputy IGP, who is now also in charge of operations? Well, that is why I uh, would have thought that the appointment would come without any qualification. So that in the absence of the IGP, the um, Deputy Inspector General of Police would perform his functions. But now the way it is, I, I can foresee uh, the, 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 the president appointing another person as um, an IGP. But that, 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 that would create problems because we haven't had that before. It would mean that the entire hierarchy of the uh, police service would have to be reorganized. That would be something new. Uh, Mr. Bonner, you were making a comment on the existing role we have a director general responsible for operations. Now we have a, a, a deputy IGP who is also going to be in charge of operations. Well, usually, as far as even with the, uh, the, the order of uh, the, on, on their role, or the role call, the IGP is technically in charge of everything. And then you have uh, those who uh, are specifically asked to do uh, maybe uh, services uh, and, and, and the like, HR and the like. And in the absence of the IGP, then the deputy steps in and, and performs, uh, you know, the, the, that role. But now we have a deputy IGP in charge of operations. Does that mean the DG operations will, will go comatose? We won't have any work to do. Are we going to have several other deputy IGPs? I don't want to believe so. I don't want to think so. But uh, it's only time that will tell. We, it's just that the... The timing, if you ask me, every every person who security watcher, political watchers, will be asking the same questions. Why do this four months into uh, you know a high tension elections when the the EC boss is actually uh, saying that to, today? I think she did a press conference saying whoever loses the elections must must accept, and the political commentators are arguing all over the place. So I think that whatever is done around this time, the president, the executive would have to be very careful so that we don't have a Kenya-style uh, chaos in this country. We need to be very measured in what we are doing because then I don't think, and today, a survey uh, that has been conducted says that a majority of the young people, 53 or so, on the continent have never seen coup before, and so they think military rule is, is an option to this type of democracy. So I don't think that the timing is very good, if you ask me, in terms of these things. So the president would have to be very measured in whatever decisions is taken from now on in terms of our security architecture. Yeah, and, and Mr. Gaga, talking about the IGP, that leaked tape report that was a subject of your committee's work, isn't complete, is it? I mean, from what we heard from the floor of parliament, the speaker has asked that this returns for you to do some more work on this. Where are you with completing it for the House to take a final decision? Oh, Evans, the report was subsequently debated thoroughly and adapted by the House. So the committee's work is complete. Its report has been adapted by the House. And the speaker ordered that a copy of the report be served on the president for his agent attention and action. So in there, you expect the recommendations that you make to be carried and enforced. And I, I note you obviously raise issues about the individuals who had plotted, and that's a conspiracy that you established. Uh, you're expecting the president to carry out those uh, findings and recommendations. Absolutely, Evans. The conspiracy against the current IGP was established beyond doubt that 
COP Mensa, Superintendent Sari and JB had conspired to remove him in order to allow for the breaking of the eight. But most fundamentally, Evans, the report made far-reaching recommendations uh, aimed at ensuring that the management of election security, which is actually a, a role that the police uh, must play, I mean, they play a lead role, you know, ought to be um, handled in a manner that would uh, ensure that the uh, forthcoming elections are free, transparent, and fair. Very important recommendation, and I, I think that given that we are in an election year, the president would want to have a critical look at that particular recommendation. You're confident that he will? Well, if he doesn't, that, that, that would be a shame. And, and, and if he doesn't, it would mean that the president has no respect for the legislative arm of government, which, which could result in his uh, removal or impeachment from office. Because remember that the legislative arm of government, I mean, is established under the Constitution. And now, as president, he has sworn an oath to protect the laws of the country and, most importantly, the Constitution. So the president must demonstrate that he believes in the rule of law, he respects the Constitution, which, which created the arm of government called the legislature. And that there is James Agaga, the ranking member of the Defense and Interior Committee. Adam Bonai is the Security Analyst Chief Executive of the Security Warehouse Limited. And if you're just joining as a deputy IGP, has just been appointed. Is he, uh, he was currently already, as we've just been heard from both the former uh, Deputy Interior Minister and Adam Bonai, uh, driving a GP2. And he's currently now the Deputy IGP, Christian Tetayonu. Uh, COP and the decision was taken at the police council meeting today and has been communicated uh, from the presidency. Well, um, let's do some other stories now. And um, the Auditor General John Sinekwema has revealed that the scores of school feeding caterers in five regions fed thousands of pupils in basic schools with unwholesome meals. In the Upper East and Greater Accra regions, for instance, auditors found that caterers at different occasions served rice that had pebbles in it and beans infested with worms and weevils. They also added that food color, and they add food color to the jollof rice, contrary to requirement, in the National Operations Manual. While in the Auditor General's latest performance audit on the school feeding program, the Auditor General also found out that food served by the cooks were not adequate to sustain their pupils through uh, the instructional period or school days. Well, my colleague James Savage has a copy of that uh, particular report by the Auditor General. James, first, walk us through what the Auditor General actually found with regard to the poor quality of food served pupils across the country. So according to the report, 58 caterers out of uh, some 245 schools, the auditors sampled across five regions provided poor quality meals for the pupils. For instance, caterers in 21 out of 73 schools in the greater Accra region and one out of 22 schools in the western region provided poor quality food for the pupils. In the Upper East region, in August 2022, had the a head teacher tool indicated that the caterer for the Zoa Primary School in the Nabdan district at different occasions served rice that had pebbles in it. It has beans, the beans were infested with worms and weevils, and uh, what it served was without delicious stew uh, attached to it. Then another specific in the Greater Accra region says that in July 2021, Zona Coordinators Monitoring Report showed that the caterer for 5th Battalion A Primary School added food color to the jollof rice contrary to the requirement of the National uh, Operations Manual. Now, according to the head teachers of the schools, the auditors visited, the caterers used unwholesome food items and did not add adequate protein to the meals for the children. The issue about quantity also came up in terms of whether the children are actually being fed the right quantity. What did the report find? Exactly. So, uh, in that report, there is a tool they call the handy measure to which every caterer is supposed to use to measure the quantity of food mm. that's supposed to be used to serve uh, the, the children. But uh, some school, some caterers, found, the auditors found out that some caterers do not have this tool and even those who have it are not using it. Mm. To some specifics, uh, they observed that during their visit to the schools, food served by the 
cooks were not adequate to sustain the children through the instructional hours. For instance, at the Medina Estate MA1 Primary School in the Greater Accra region, mm. they noted that wache prepared by the caterer was not adequate for 188 pupils. Mm. Now, the quantity is supposed to be two um, food, 16 liter food warmers. That's supposed to feed 188, but only one uh, 16 liter was provided. So half of that was used to feed the entire number. Then another specific was on uh, the uh, um, some amount of monies that have been wrongly paid. 2.3 million Ghana cities was wrongly paid, mm -hmm. which the Auditor General is asking the National Secretariat to, with, uh, to retrieve between 2019 and 2022. Now, there's a breakdown. Uh, there's an overpaid nine caterers totaling 136.5 thousand Ghana cities, which 83 thousand cities have been retrieved, leaving some 53 thousand outstanding. Now, the national secretariat also overpaid a total amount of 176.1 thousand Ghana cities to some 14 caterers. Finally, there is some hundred and some. Eight, over 800,000 Ghana cities, which is unaccounted for, okay. which are monies accrued from forms sold to persons who are interested uh, to be caterers for schools. They bought the forms, but the national secretariats have not been able to account for 861,000 Ghana cities of those form fees. All of that are some irregularities they have put out there in that report. So that's another leg that we'll be exploring further, apart from the unwholesome meals that are served the children, also mm. the irregularities about payment uh, from the school feeding program. But you have a response uh, from the Secretariat on this, at least it's in the report. What did they say? Uh, I mean, they're indicating that uh, management of the Secretariat is saying that uh, in one of their reconciliations, they overpaid a certain group of caterers. This is, uh, uh, was later deducted from their payment in subsequent term payment. This deduction was of the was to the tune of 655,511 Ghana cities. Uh, they said they would be grateful if, uh, mm -hmm. if, if they actually assist them to assess the source of the document in difference uh, of the overpayment observation in order to carry out further work on it. Other than that, they will bring to the attention of those deductions uh, to look at in the subsequent. The recommendation relating to non-cooking days is noted deductions will be made in the second term of 2023. And so that's the feedback to the overpayment as well as uh, the issue about and this was captured in monies. the report in terms of the response of the school feeding program to all the concerns that were raised by the auditor general the unwholesome meals and of course uh, the overpayment uh, that was made to uh, the school feeding and some of the caterers and these are some of the issues captured in the auditor general's report uh, thankfully we can speak to dorothy of Sapon, secretary of shanty regional school feeding caterers also joining me is clement apart the deputy ranking on the education committee. Uh, Dorothy, thanks for time here on Newsnight. Hello, Dorothy, can you hear me? Okay, uh, we don't seem to have Dorothy's attention, but we have Clementa Park with us. Hello, Mr. Park. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Good evening, Ivan. Great Good evening to, to our listeners, particularly my constituents in Bruce South. Uh, great to have you. I have Dorothy now. Hello, Dorothy. Hello. Hello. Hi, Dorothy. Uh, great to have you. Dorothy, why are your members serving unwholesome food to children in schools? Thank you very much, and good evening to you and your audience. My dear, it is never true, but then if you are saying that the food, the quantity of the food is not enough, then one, I would agree with you 100%. But well, the Auditor, General, the Auditor General says the quantity is not enough, but also found that wholesome food served to the children, including foods that had pebbles in it and weevils as well. Oh, that is why I'm saying that with that aspect, I'm afraid, because I'm also a mother. And whatever food I cook, I also bring some home for my children to eat. So that one, I don't even understand. Because one, all the type of food that we cook for them, they enjoy it. Even the teachers, when you finish, they would rather bring their bowls first. And so I wonder why they are saying that on wholesome food, on wholesome food. I wonder. I, 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 I don't even understand. Maybe it might be one out of thousand, but... For the women in general to cook and hold some food, I'm afraid. Well, it's not one out of thousand. I mean, for example, in the greater Accra region, when the Auditor General sampled, and this is evidence they gathered, caterers in 21 
of 73 schools in the greater Accra region, one of 22 schools in the western region, provided poor quality food for the pupils. So what type of food was that described as poor? Well, poor because it had pebbles in it. Some of them had worms and weevils. In fact, in Jolov, they were adding color to the rice. Oh, really? Well, then the I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, because that, that one, I've never experienced some before, so I don't know. But we know that because of the price of the food, we don't use enough um, um, ingredient to do it. For instance, if we have to use about maybe um, 50 cities, um onion, we'll use about 20 or 30. Because the ingredients, they are all very expensive. And if you are going to use tomato soup and you have to use maybe two things of tomato, you use one. And so you will not get the, 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 the fairness of the rice. But using color, for me, no, out. Um, Dr. Clement Park, you're hearing the, the uh, Shanti Regional Secretary of the, uh, the Caterers, and making the point that well, he, she's not aware that this is happening. But this is the Auditor General's report. And this is evidence that has been gathered. Will f surely be coming to Parliament, the Public Accounts Committee. What's your reaction? But most importantly, what must be done to deal with this? Well, you know, let me say good evening to you again. And to commend the Auditor, uh, Auditor General for doing the performance uh, audit on the school feeding uh, program. Uh, it is my prayer that the same will be done in terms of the feeding arrangements for our wards in the secondary, secondary school system. Uh, but let me say that I am not surprised about the findings as uh, captured in the Auditor General's report. Uh, whilst uh, my sister speaking from Kumasi uh, may be doing the right thing under uh, very strenuous circumstances, uh, it is also the case that we get reports, and I've received some of those reports. I know firsthand that indeed this is the situation in some of the schools. So I think what we ought to be looking at is to look at the issue holistically. Uh, one factor that may contribute to some unscrupulous caterers, in fact, serving our wards with poison uh, rather than food, could be the very meager amount that government has chosen to pay them to feed a child per day. Uh, remember that uh, until recently, it was uh, 99 pesos per child per day. Uh, after a protest by the school feeding caterers, supported by many advocates, including myself, we were hoping that government would have at least increased it to about three cities, 50 pesos, or four cities. Eventually, the government told us that it had increased it from the 99 pesos to one CD, 20 pesos. Even in this economy, for the past two to three years, can one CD, 20 pesos even feed a pet cat, let alone be sufficient enough to feed a child of school-going age? The other issue that I think is exciting about this expose is the fact that monies have been paid to persons who clearly have not fed students in any school. And that reaffirms the long-standing suspicion that the school feeding program has become a conduit for some unscrupulous public servants and their cronies to siphon public resources for purposes either than what the monies are supposed to be used for. And, and from where you said, in the interest of time, specifically as a member of parliament, also on the committee responsible for education, what do you plan to do about this? Well, because it's an audit report, it clearly will be tabled and the speaker will refer it to the Public Accounts Committee. And I believe the Public Accounts Committee will then invite the sector minister. This will be the Minister for Gender, Children and Social Protection, and the minister would consequentially also invite the person in charge of the school feeding program to appear before the Public Accounts Committee at a certain day and time to be determined by the committee to respond to all of these red flags that have been raised.
Uh, thank you very much. And that there is Clementa Park. Dr. Clementa Park is the deputy ranking on the Education Committee. Uh, for those of us who went to Saito, um, this is something we're very familiar with. But one CD, 20 pesos. I mean, if our power is a mother, maybe she can do some magic with that. Nothing you can do about it. Uh, with one CD, 20 pesos? What can you do with it? Oh, you can't can uh, do anything with it. Really, you can't do anything. I'm surprised that Dorothy is saying that they feed the children with good food. But honestly, really, if you look at some of the food that they feed as children with, it's something that you can't even give to your pets. Honestly, your we pet need to cat. do something. They, they can't yes, even eat it. Like said, you can they uh, your pet cat. Yeah. <laughs> pet cat. No. Even the cat, they I know. Today, they even the cat will reject the food. Honestly. Honestly. It's sad. I, I want to hear from you. 55 is the WhatsApp line. We have a child in school and you're hearing now that you're being said we, we will infect the food. Uh, worms as well. I mean, for worms Charlie. as well. And the jollof, and he, as she explains it, this tomato is expensive. So if you want a great color for the jollof to be appetizing, then you have to add some color to it. That's Just poison. do and one more for them. Do you have to do jollof fries by force? That's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. uh, one more with some uh, yes. shito and maybe one it's fried egg. The pepper is the best. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, let's hear from you on that um, here on News Tonight. George, after this year, George, this is something that you never experienced. I'm pretty sure of that. He doesn't uh, know what we are talking about. He has no idea <laughs> what, what we are talking to, about. I mean, in situations, I don't know. I mean, the fact is that yes, there are students out there. Mm. Mm. Going you don't need to experience it before you know that it is bad. It is terrible. Yes. What do you have in the headlines? Well, coming up, pick up in VAT collections. It plays a significant role in helping Ghana Revenue Authority to hit up your target of 68 billion Ghana cities. And government affirms commitment in securing strategic partner to help turn around the dwindling fortunes of Tema Oil Refining. The Business News on Newsnight is brought to you by MTN Business. Welcome to the new world of business, kingdom books and stationery, synthesis tanks and pepsodent, hairball and charcoal. Welcome back to Business on Newsnight. Now, strong pickup in VAT collections from April this year and other initiatives helped the Ghana Avenue Authority to hit its half-year target of 68 billion Ghana cities. The authority, for instance, maintained that the rollout of its electronic VAT invoicing system also played a major role in bringing on board new taxpayers. The Ghana Avenue Authority is looking at moving away from enforcement into the approach to more of collaborative partner approach with business and other taxpayers out there. Meanwhile, economist Dr. Dusakwadi is optimistic that the Ghana Avenue Authority would hit its end-of-year target based on some of these measures implemented in the first half of this year. It also shows that we, we are on course with the fiscal consolidation program that we have. Because the more revenue we get, the lower will be the gap between the revenue and expenditure if we keep expenditure constant. And also, you also recall that Two years ago, Ghana was downgraded, and one of the reasons was that we could not pass the revenue measures in our budget, and, the, and therefore the creditors were not sure that the government of Ghana would be able to uh, mobilize enough resources to service their debt. So if GRA is making this progress, it is uh, something good and that we must celebrate and also tell them to do more and, and be on track. But my question has always been that, uh, I mean, what kind of optimal target did they set for themselves? Um, I'm here to interrogate the data because, I, because you must set an optimal target. And then if you exceed it, then you know that you're really on course. So. Economist Dr. Edu Sarkodie. Now, government has given the firm assurance that it remains committed to securing a strategic partner to help turn around the dwindling fortunes of Tema Oil Refinery. It follows concerns that government hasn't shown much concern in dealing with the issues of the firm, but the Minister of State at the Energy Ministry, Bakrampa, maintained that the Tema Oil Refinery should also look at some interim partnership in working to bring other investors on board. Need an external partner, a strategic partner, as they call it. They have tried in the past to do so, albeit unsuccessfully. My thinking is that the ministry, continuing to work with the Ministry of Finance, should continue to work with TOR to, to bring in this strategic investment. Um, I think also, as we know, a private refinery called Centio, which has been set up, has a capacity of 100,000 barrels per day currently doing 40,000 barrels. I see nothing wrong with some form of partnership between Tor and Centio. Tor has the facilities and the capacity. Centio is currently producing 
uh, I believe the a conversation can be opened for both institutions to, to dialogue about some form of partnership, which I suspect helps TOR to itself start to generate more some funding. And then also we help them with the, the conversation about a, a strategic partner. Herbert Krapa is the Minister of State at the Energy Ministry. Now, some offshore investors are still skeptical about government exercising fiscal discipline in the roundup to the December elections. Now, this despite promises from government that it will maintain the needed fiscal prudence in the roundup to the elections. The IMF's post second review raised concerns about the election related spending could derail the program. Let's hear from one investor who has been speaking at the stakeholder engagement of the mid year budget review. Because if you work off the assumption that you would get the money, it won't come. And you end up with a much larger fiscal deficit gap than we all envisage. Okay. And finally, the point on market confidence around T bills being restructured or not is evident on what happened in the domestic debt exchange. Once you buy the security, you are at the mercy of the state infrastructure when it comes to restructuring. So the moral situation or the regulatory uh, constraints, Bank of Ghana putting out that regulatory guidance that said you apply 100% risk weighting on the old bonds, literally coercing every financial institution to restructure their securities. That same card can be played in treasury bill restructuring in the future. And every bank board of governors is looking at that scenario. The risk of default of domestic market is now on the table for every institution in terms, in terms of financial risk management. And that is an investor sharing some concerns about government maintaining the needed fiscal discipline in the election period. Now, loan-related concerns by consumers and borrowers topped the list of complaints received by the Bank of Ghana for last year. Now, that's according to the 2023 Annual Complaints Management Report released by the Central Bank. There is more in this report. According to the 2023 Complaints Management Report by the Bank of Ghana, despite the fall in the number of complaints recorded, complaints continue to increase in complexity, thereby requiring more time for resolution. Out of the 695 complaints, 458 were resolved and 237 remain unresolved as at the end of 2023. The complaint resolution rate of 66% was a marginal improvement over the 64% achieved in 2022. Meanwhile, while email was the most preferred channel for lodging complaints, accounting for 42% of the total number of complaints reported to the Bank of Ghana in 2023. This was followed by walk-in with 26%. According to the 2023 Complaints Management Report by the Bank of Ghana, email was the most preferred channel because it afforded complainants a more convenient means to provide supporting documentation for their complaints. That is the business desk report. Let's now turn our attention to the stock market. And if you're a holder of MTN shares, well, the value of each share that you are holding has gone up by 9 pesos and is now worth 2 Ghana cities, 10 pesos. Enterprise Group was up by 5 pesos to close at 1 Ghana city, 37 pesos. Now, if you had invested on the Ghana stock exchange from the beginning of the year to now, your returns is now more than 30%. Now, that is way, way better than what you're getting on other investment instruments on the market. And that's all for Business on Newsnight. I don't thank you very much. We can do some sports now. Hello, Mr. Kante. Hi, Evans. Will you believe that uh, parliamentary select team, captain by MP for Ododo Diodio, Ni Lanti Vanderpoel, were 3-1 winners. 3-1? Yes. That's a miracle. That's a How did that miracle. happen? I'm did you watch the game? <laughs> I'm surprised <laughs> myself. <laughs> Yeah, they beat uh, Black Stars legend team in the curtain race of the Maiden Democracy Cup earlier today. Now, Patrick Boachi Yadom, MP for Obwasi, he scored the opening goal uh, for the parliamentarians before ex Black Stars midfielder Suli Muntari equalized uh, through a free kick. Then, parliamentary staff member Faisal Abubakar then added two goals to secure the famous results for the lawmakers. Did you say staff? Yeah. What do they do? What does he do? Which department is he? Did they say? Know. They just called him staff. There's no rented player, eh? No. Okay. Right. But MP for Enshire, so Stephen Amwa, uh, South Tong uh, MP, Kwabna Woyome, and then Tamale, South MP, Harana Idris, were all in action for the parliamentary select team. So, 
to be frank, to be frank, the MPs were majority of the team. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, oh they okay. Did, okay. Yeah, they did nice. really well. They seem very fit. Wow. Very I see. Fit. Yeah, fit nice. Obviously, they're in the wrong profession. They should have played for the Black Stars. They may have won the World Cup. And Having possibly, Idris, who I'm not surprised. Yeah, possibly because, even yeah. won a, you know, a, an African no, but to be cap. frank, uh, Patrick Boachi Adams' first touch is elite. Better wow. than Lukaku. Oh, by far. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> by far. But no wonder like they criticize the Black Stars the way they do when yeah. they get the opportunity. Yeah, they have every you know what right you're talking to, about. Yeah. Every right to considering <laughs> what we saw earlier today. But Manchester United are set to sign 18-year-old French centre-back Lenny Euro from Leo for about 50 million euros. Uh, Euro completed his first part of his medical earlier today and is expected to be announced in the coming days. 38-year-old Luka Modric has signed a one-year extension with Real Madrid, which will keep him in the club until 2025. That's all for sports. Back to you, Max. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Danny Granting. Let's do um, the Supreme Court. Let's head um, to the courts now. And uh, the anti-LGBTQ bill will remain in Parliament uh, for a while longer as um, the Supreme Court has deferred its ruling on an interlocutory application that aimed to prevent Parliament from transmitting the bill to the President. So the two applicants, Richard Delasky and Dr. Amanda Odoi, contend that the bill breaches some provisions of the Constitution and should not be transmitted to the president. So the five-member uh, Supreme Court panel chaired by Chief Justice Getro Tokonu in deferring its ruling indicated that it will give the decision in the injunction application and the substantive application together in an early trial. Richard Kojonyaku um, is still around. Um, he's been monitoring this all morning, still here with us in the studios. So Richard, let's talk about the reasons the court gave in advance in arriving at this decision. So the court said that if it does a composite ruling, the interest of justice will be better served. Substantive suit together, enabling this court to deliver a more informed, comprehensive, and just decision that accounts for all relevant circumstances and factors in this important matter. Such a unified approach will further provide context and clarity and also afford a clearer understanding of the issues raised in this interlocutory matter and their impact on the main seat. Having therefore diligently analyzed all the material processes on the record in this instant application and listened to oral submissions by learned counsel for the parties, our decision is to reserve our verdict on the interlocutory application until the final determination of the substantive suit, at which point we will render a comprehensive judgment that addresses all aspects of the case, including the current application for injunction. In conclusion, the decision of this court on this, on this application for an interlocutory injunction is hereby deferred to abide the outcome of the determination of the substantive suit. So, Richard, does it mean that Parliament can now transmit the bill to the presidency? No, um, the bill still remains in Parliament until a final determination of the substantive matter has been determined. Once that, the whole thing can be better dealt with in a substantive action. And it's permissible for a court to do that. It's, it's nothing unusual at all. The court actually referred to it, an existing rule on injunctions. And, and so that, I think that the, the court is, is, is fair in, in coming by that approach. I mean, if as at this stage, the process have not been transmitted, and there must be a reason for that. The reason is that there was this application for interlocutory injunction pending. And the court has still not disposed of the application for interlocutory injunction. The court said the determination of that application for interlocutory injunction should abide the determination of the main case. And for that matter, it is reserving its determination until the main action is heard. That's the Attorney General, go for your word, I mean. uh, Let's talk about the latest uh, Afrobarometer report that it has positioned down among countries in Africa, witnessing a significant and continuous dip in the democratic scorecard. Now, this trend is because of the current economic crisis, corruption, and mismanagement, which is breeding anger and disaffection, especially among the youth. The director of survey at the Afrobarometer, Boniface Dulani, who made these staggering revelations, recommended immediate pragmatic measures to avert a Kenyan like situation in Ghana. And the youth, I think, are more dissatisfied with the democracy and they also are more inclined to support authoritarian forms of government, especially military rule. 
I think uh, part of the problem here and the challenge, especially for the youth, is that uh, when you also ask our respondents, what are the most important things that they want the governments to be addressing? And unemployment is, I think, a big, big problem, and especially for the youth. So they are looking at uh, alternative forms of government that they can help to deliver on their needs and especially uh, on creation of jobs. Specifically to the countries, you made mention that some countries are seeing a dip in democratic scorecards, specifically Ghana. Tell us what the situation actually is on the ground. Well, of course, I mean, this is a very big continent, so as the report highlights, there are differences from country to country. Some of the countries like Ghana, we've seen a huge drop in satisfaction with democracy. And I think the, you know, the reasons, as we know many of them, the economic situation in Ghana in recent years has not been particularly great. Uh, you know, the youth have, as I've already said, like their colleagues elsewhere, are not happy with the amount of jobs that are being created. So most youth are going to, uh, to attend the educa higher education, and then when they complete higher education, you find that there are no jobs to absorb them. But they are also disillusioned by the high levels of corruption. So on one hand, governments are telling the people that, look, brace up uh, for these tough times, but then they look at the political leaders are not themselves really demonstrating that they too want to live that kind of life that they are also, they also sacrificing. So what should be done immediately? I think it is important that the governments really listen to the voices of the people. And that's what Afrobarometer is trying to do, to make sure that the voices of ordinary citizens are heard. Because if governments don't listen to the people, then the key either the next thing is that the governments, I mean, the people will vote out the governments, or as we've seen, I think people will be looking at alternative forms of government. That's the director of survey at Afrobarometer, Boniface Julani. Well, there's also an advice um, by the immediate past EC chairman for Malawi, uh, Dr. Chifundu Kachale, advising the Electoral Commission of Ghana not to take the findings for granted. Well, today we've also been hearing from the EC chairperson herself, um, the, the Democracy Cup was presented to her earlier today by the leadership of parliament. This is what he had to say to the various political parties. We're all mindful of the fact that we stand at the dawn of yet another election, the 2024 general election. And therefore, this initiative to promote and trumpet peace in Ghana across the 16 regions of Ghana is a laudable one. We applaud the speaker and the leadership for the Democracy Cup that will culminate in the playing of a football match this afternoon at the Accra Sports Stadium. And I believe the essence of the CAP is to demonstrate to the citizenry, and particularly the youth, that elections is also a contest. And at the end of the day, parties put in their very best, but at the end of the contest, at the end of the match, one emerges the winner. And just as the football match is conducted in an open and transparent manner, so are the electoral processes of the Electoral Commission of Ghana. From the very beginning, the registration through to the collation and the declaration of the results, our processes are also undertaken in an open and transparent manner, involving key stakeholders, i.e. the political parties, the security agencies, and the citizenry. And it is also done in an open and transparent manner. And so just like the football match, we serve as the midwives that birth the elections. We are the referees that conduct and that lay the election and the processes that lead to you know, the, the, the election day itself. And so as referees, we are committed to you know, ensuring that our activities from now in the lead up to the election and all our electoral processes are transparent, they are open, they are fair. And that is Madam Jean Menton, the uh, chairperson of the Electoral Commission. And tonight we are looking at Health Manifesto, the big focus on PM Express. Oh, yes. On the Joy yes, News yes. Channel. Yeah. Prime Minister Ponsiru uh, is going to be a main, uh, he's, he's going to present this with me. Okay. Uh, because he has uh, done a lot of the data digging and he has come up with what the ideal health manifesto should be. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we'll have a discussion. So you don't want to miss that. It's a special Sitting edition. Down.
Um, just you, you stay, tuned. stay tuned. Now. Stay tuned. Okay, uh, great. And we're gonna. So we're extending this. Uh, this is gonna be one hour thirty minutes. Uh, first uh, thirty two minutes. Hours, please. We'll have a discuss and then uh, presentation of the help manifesto, and then we have the panelists discussing it. You don't want to miss that at all. Okay. But right now on radio, coming up is strong and sassy Noella Karen oh Yali. What oh are we talking darling. about tonight? So we're celebrating the celebrity teacher, an amazing woman doing great, uh, you know, exploits. Mm. Yeah, in the area of education. And we want to get to know more about her, you know, exploits. So, yeah. We're staying with the strong. Absolutely. We're out of here. I am MFR Paul. Hey, my name is Abans Mensah. <laughs>